Most laboratories are carefully designed and equipped to protect the health and safety of the people who work in them. And laboratory workers are usually well-educated and highly skilled in lab procedures. These factors should add up to an accident-free workplace, but unfortunately, a surprising number of well-qualified people suffer injury or chronic illness as a result of working in the laboratory. That's because, all too often, safety in the lab is taken for granted. For example, some laboratory workers tend to underestimate chemical health hazards because they're very familiar with the chemistry of the materials they work with, without knowing or taking seriously the material's toxicology. The same thing is true about other lab safety and health concerns. Some workers are either unaware of the hazards or they're unconcerned. The fact is, the potential for harm in a laboratory is very real. Under certain circumstances, some materials can explode without warning. Some can destroy skin, lung, and eye tissue. Others can cause cancer in you or birth defects in your children. It is essential that you know what the hazards are and know how to deal with them. In this program, we'll take a close look at two major categories of hazards you're likely to encounter, safety hazards and health hazards. We'll explain some general guidelines for avoiding injury or exposure, and then we'll make certain you know how to react if you do face an emergency. Let's begin with a safety hazard that is one of the most frequent causes of laboratory injuries, broken glassware. Never use glassware that is cracked or chipped. Make sure you select glassware designed for the use you intend to put it to particularly if you're heating or evacuating the container. And because even the right glassware can fail, wrap or shield vessels to be used at reduced pressure in case of implosion. Contact with hot or extremely cold objects is another common laboratory hazard. Unfortunately, a hot beaker or crucible often looks just like one at room temperature. If there is any chance an object might be hot, Pause a second to determine if it is hot before picking it up. And don't forget, cold can burn too. Some gases which are released from pressure are cold enough to cause a serious burn. Use the appropriate protective equipment and follow procedures carefully whenever you're working around hot or extremely cold objects. Compressed gas cylinders are very common in the lab, but never take working with them for granted. Very specific procedures must be followed because there's always the potential for an explosive release of pressure. A valve or fitting can be blown off with enough force to blast through several concrete walls. First of all, whether you're storing a cylinder or using it, compressed gas cylinders should always be kept away from high temperatures. When you move a cylinder of compressed gas, you must prevent the cylinder from falling over. Strap the cylinder to the hand truck, and when you're transferring it from the truck, move it very carefully. The cylinder must remain capped until it's strapped in place and ready to use. Do not improvise with connections, gauges, and regulators. Use only equipment that is specified for the application. Whenever you're working with a compressed gas, always stand to the side out of the potential flight path of any valve or fitting. And when removing a cylinder, recap it before unstrapping and moving it, even if there's very little gas remaining. The residual pressure in a cylinder can still be dangerous. Chemical fire and explosion are potential hazards in most laboratories because many materials used in the lab are highly flammable. These materials must be kept away from ignition sources. For that reason, open flames are seldom used in the lab. If you do use a flame, follow all laboratory regulations and let others in the lab know that you're going to use an open flame. Under some conditions, even a very weak ignition source can be disastrous. For example, when peroxides form in a container, just the friction of turning the cap can cause an explosion. The most obvious sign of possible peroxide formation is the presence of crystals. Standard operating procedure in a situation like this is to turn the bottle over to the bomb squad. Unfortunately, 
peroxides can form in a container without providing any visible clue. The key to preventing accidents is tight inventory control. A good practice with diethyl and diisopropyl ethers is to date a container when it's first opened. If the container is still around after one month's time, have the contents tested for peroxides before using it. There are a number of materials that must be kept separate from each other. Some produce highly flammable or toxic reaction products upon contact with each other. Reactives like metal hydrides or sodium metals must be prevented from contacting water because of the tremendous heat quickly produced in their reaction. If a fire does break out, follow your laboratory's specific fire response procedures. That means you need to know what they are now because you won't have time to look them up when you need them. If clothing catches fire, the preferred method is to get under a shower if it is immediately accessible or roll on the floor until the flame is extinguished. In addition to the safety hazards you might face in the lab, many of the chemicals you work with are either corrosive or toxic. These health hazards may require very special consideration when you plan and perform your work. Exposure to corrosives, hydrogen fluoride, sulfuric acid, and other strong acids, and bases such as sodium or potassium hydroxide, usually produces an immediate and painful burn. Sometimes the effects are delayed for a few minutes or even an hour or more, but eventually the corrosive will react with moisture on the skin. Corrosives are even more damaging if they splash into an eye or if mists come in contact with the mucous membranes of the mouth, throat, or lungs. Toxics interfere with the cell metabolism. In cases of acute toxicity, the effects are immediate. Cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, or chlorine can kill very quickly. Other substances have long-term or chronic effects. Symptoms or an illness may not develop until after repeated exposures to the substance over a long period of time, or after some time interval following a single exposure. In the case of sensitizers or allergens, the symptoms are often rashes or respiratory problems. Other chronic toxic effects include cancer, reproductive disorders, and damage to vital organs or the nervous system. For example, in the case of mercury or acrylonitrile, you may not feel the effects of exposure until years later when you develop emotional or memory dysfunction or are diagnosed with cancer. Some studies have shown that there is a higher incidence of certain forms of cancer among chemists than in the general population. A number of materials have been identified as carcinogens or suspected carcinogens. Known carcinogens include substances like benzidine, vinyl chloride, ethylenamine, and of course the N-nitrosamines. Mercury, carbon tetrachloride, and chloroform can seriously damage your lungs, liver, kidneys, or nervous system. That damage can be fatal. Reproductive hazards range from sterility to malformation of the embryo. Carbon disulfide can cause a variety of reproductive disorders in both men and women. Now, there are four ways in which you can become exposed to corrosive and toxic chemicals. Injection, ingestion, inhalation, or contact with skin or eyes. If you eliminate or block these avenues, you'll be protected from any of the chemical health hazards you might face at work. As you might guess, injection of a chemical directly into the bloodstream is the least frequent route of exposure, but it does happen. As a result of injury, such as a cut from broken contaminated glass or an accidental needle stick, Handle broken glassware and syringes with extreme care and use prescribed disposal techniques so that a coworker, janitorial person, or a person even further removed from the work area is not faced with a hazard. Ingesting a chemical occurs more frequently than you might think because there are people who insist on pipetting by mouth. Every year, a number of them are rushed to the hospital. This is a double hazard and anyone who does it is only asking for trouble.
Even if you are absolutely sure that your control is good enough to keep the material you are pipetting out of your mouth, there is no way to keep from inhaling its vapors. Over the years, that exposure adds up. Don't take chances. Use a pipette bulb or automatic pipette. Do not eat, smoke, chew gum, or apply facial preparations in the laboratory. And before leaving the lab, wash your hands thoroughly, even if you've been wearing gloves. Never keep food in an area where chemicals are used or stored. Inhaled hazardous dust, vapors, fumes, and gases can pose a serious threat. Proper ventilation is absolutely critical to provide safe working conditions for laboratory workers. Working in a properly functioning hood or glove box is your best defense against airborne exposure. Most labs have certification programs where hood function is periodically tested for adequate performance. Before you begin a procedure in a hood, make sure there is in fact airflow. Don't rely on the hood light or the sound of the fan motor. In one case, a perchloric acid hood which sounded like it was normally operating was found to have no airflow at all. The fan blades had corroded and fallen off. If you have any doubt about whether flow is adequate, discuss the problem with the lab supervisor or safety officer before you use the hood. Many labs have the flow measured and certified at a certain aperture size. The hood is then marked accordingly. This marking indicates the maximum opening dimension at which the hood may safely be operated. However, keeping the hood open to this maximum setting is not the safest way to operate. A hood should be kept closed when its use is required, except when you are actually working within the hood space. Under those circumstances, keep the sash closed as far as is comfortable and always within the maximum distance. In this way, you'll decrease the amount of contamination escaping back into the lab and will also increase the amount of sash between you and any potential accident. Work as far within the hood space as you can, comfortably and safely. Most experts consider six inches from the opening a good minimum working distance. Sash opening should be free of any obstruction. Set equipment up on blocks or a stand to minimize turbulence and maximize airflow. Special procedures and emergencies may require the use of a respirator. If your work requires a respirator, you will be formally fit tested and trained in how to use it correctly and how to check for proper fit. An important part of that training will be cartridge selection. Different classes of chemicals require different cartridges. More lab workers are injured from spilling a chemical on their skin or splashing it into an eye than by any other kind of exposure. Toxins can affect the body by getting into the bloodstream after absorption. Caution while working with chemicals and wearing the right personal protective equipment are your best defense against contact. Make sure you wear the right type of gloves. Consult your supervisor or the glove manufacturer's literature if you aren't sure. Gloves should be inspected to be sure they're not discolored, punctured, or torn. If they are impermeable to water, wash them before you take them off. This protects your hands from contact with chemicals left on the gloves, and it protects the gloves from buildup of chemical residue. All glove materials eventually become permeated with chemicals, and gloves should be replaced periodically, whether they appear to be damaged or not. Lab coats, aprons, and rubber or plastic boots provide protection against splashes. Remove any protective clothing before you leave the lab. Leave the hazard in the lab. Don't take it home with you. Follow your lab's policy for decontamination or disposal of protective clothing. Eyes are especially vulnerable to the hazards of chemical exposure, particularly to water reactive chemicals. At the very minimum, always protect your eyes with safety glasses fitted with side shields. Depending on the chemicals you're working with, you may need the added protection of goggles or a face shield. Okay, so far we've looked at the kinds of safety and health hazards present in many laboratories and the ways you might be exposed to them. 
but that's not enough. It is absolutely critical to know exactly what the potential hazards are for each of the materials you work with and the procedures you perform. Information on chemical hazards is available to you in a number of ways. Check the label, but keep in mind that labels may not tell you everything you need to know. A Material Safety Data Sheet, or MSDS, is provided by the chemical manufacturer for all hazardous materials brought into your facility. The MSDS outlines important physical characteristics, health and safety considerations, and contains the manufacturer's address and phone number. An MSDS may still not be enough, in which case you might need to consult colleagues or reference materials. If your questions are still not answered, discuss the problem with your supervisor or your facility's safety officer. Whenever a formal, standard operating procedure exists, follow it exactly. Don't shortcut any approval process. Case histories have shown that often it's the person who's most familiar with a procedure who is tempted to take a dangerous shortcut. Plan for the best way to transport and position your materials for the procedure, and plan for disposal of the chemicals when the procedure is completed. Careful and proper disposal of hazardous wastes is extremely important. Make sure you follow your facility's written policy. Now, before closing, let's consider some general guidelines and recommendations that can make a real difference in your health and safety. An important attitude to develop and maintain is to never underestimate any risk. Worst case scenario should always be mentally played out before beginning any procedure, and then positive steps taken to prevent the situation. For example, if your setup will be left unattended and it requires city utilities like water or electricity, determine what will happen if the service is interrupted. Preventing mishaps is critical, but you've got to take the planning process further so that you're fully prepared to deal with any potential emergency before it happens. Make sure you're familiar with any signs or symptoms associated with exposure to the chemicals you work with. It is very common for workers to associate strong odors with toxic chemicals and become concerned when an unpleasant odor is noticed. The odor may or may not indicate a problem, but unfortunately, some hazardous chemicals cannot be detected by any of the five senses. Some may give you immediate symptoms of exposure, dizziness, nausea, headache, confusion, shortness of breath, loss of consciousness, blurry vision, burning, itching or watery eyes, itching or burning skin. Any of these may indicate chemical overexposure. If an exposure does occur, it's critical that you be perfectly clear about what to do. Because the faster you stop exposure to a chemical, the less the chance of permanent damage. Before you begin even a routine operation, Check on the locations of emergency equipment, showers, eye washes, first aid kits. Know where they are. Be sure access to them is clear. And be sure you know how to use them. If a chemical comes in contact with skin or splashes on clothing, get to running fresh water. If the spill is not localized, get to a shower immediately. Start the shower before you begin to remove your clothing. Be sure all of the chemical is out of your hair and off of your face before you remove goggles. And stay under the shower for 15 or 20 minutes. If the chemical has gotten into your eyes, hold your eyelids open to wash them. You want the water to wash over as much of the surface of the eye as possible. If a chemical has been inhaled, get to fresh air immediately. If you're helping someone else, Begin first aid if it is necessary, and you're trained to do so. You may need to perform rescue breathing or CPR. Keep your training in these procedures up to date. In the case of injection, ingestion, or inhalation, follow the first aid procedures on the MSDS and call a poison control center or other emergency service. If medical attention is required, either on site or at a hospital, Provide medical personnel with a copy of the appropriate MSDS. Be certain you are prepared to deal with a spill. 
Cleaning up spills can be a relatively simple matter of diluting and absorbing the chemical and disposing of the waste properly. Or it may require persons with special training and protective equipment. You need to know which situation applies to each of the chemicals being used or stored in your work area. In any case, make sure the method used to dilute, contain, and remove the spill is not going to make the situation worse. If you have any questions, ask your supervisor to review procedures with you. With your education and experience, you already have a head start on laboratory safety. Stay ahead by learning as much as you can about the toxicity of the chemicals you use and know how to protect yourself. Never assume that you're immune from any safety or health hazard. Know what the hazards are and respect them.